there's more value in the connections outside of these talks than actually listening to the talks themselves. Like uh, we've spoken to a lot of very experienced, very tenured people who have lots of, you know, great stories um, and mistakes that we can learn from so that we don't have to make them as well. Okay, yeah. So a little bit about me. My name is Alon Wolf. I started learning C++ in high school because I wanted to make video games and found out I really enjoy it. Back then, all I knew about C++ was that there was a pop-up I needed to click on to install games. Today, I'm working as a senior software engineer at Metronic, specializing in computer graphics. Where I work, we make robots for spine surgeries, so I get to do what I love while also help improving patients' lives. In my spare time, I write a technical blog and participate in game jams. I also like to experiment and try new things in C++. One of the reasons I'm able to do it is thanks to the openness and sharing of this community, both online and offline, which I highly appreciate. I have watched many CPP con talks, some of them multiple times, and to be here today is really a, a dream come true. In this talk, we are going to take a deep dive into the world of compile time parsers. But we will also cover other aspects of the language, so I hope you will find it useful, even if compile time parsing isn't your cup of tea. <laughs> about the structure of this talk. First, we are going to talk about expressiveness in C++ and how we can write more expressive code. Then we will look at open source compile time libraries. For each library, we will look at its API, design, and some implementation details. Some of the code that you will see here has been modified to fit the slides, but you can find the original source code of these libraries on GitHub. Finally, we will see how we can use reflection and integrate it with compile time parsers, and also show how we can use compile time parsers to create functions, types, and tree data structures. For our purpose, a parser is something that takes text or tokens and returns a value or a parsing error. So for example, in a compiler, the lexer converts the text into tokens, which are then passed to the parser to create the syntax tree. Or in a web browser, we can pass text directly to a JSON parser to create a JavaScript object. One way to write parsers is with parser combinators. Parser combinator allows us to create a new parser by combining existing ones. For example, if we have a parse string function that takes the input text and the current parsing position, and returns a string or an error, and we have a similar parse int function that returns an integer or an error, we can create a new function that parses a string or an int by first calling parse string, and if it fails, calling parse int. Because all these functions have the exact same uh, arguments, we can modify this pseudo syntax and remove the function arguments. Another way to create parsers is with parser generators. A parser generator can create a parser from a grammar. Some popular parsing algorithms that are used in generators are LL1, LR1, LALR, and others. Here we have an example of a grammar definition that, that uses the EBNF syntax. In this example, assignment is defined as an identifier followed by colon equals, followed by a number or identifier or a string. Let's look how we can make our C++ code more expressive. When we say expressive code, we mean code that communicates its purpose. For example, what it does, why it was written, or, or how it should be used. And it relies on two things, the syntax of the programming language and the naming convention. In this talk, we are going to focus on the syntax part. As the language evolves, we get new syntax that we can use to write more expressive code. In this, here we have two examples of a code that creates a vector with four integers. The C++11 example is more expressive because it has less boilerplate. It doesn't need to create a C-style array or use size of, both of which burdens the people who need to work with this code. Another way we can make our code more expressive is with operator overloading. With operator overloading, we can use operators to call a costume function for specific types. In this example, by using operators, our code can be written from left to right and without parentheses. Also, the division operator is a good choice for path concatenation because it is a common way to represent paths in many operating systems. Domain-specific language, or DSL, is a language that is designed to solve problems in a specific domain. So, after we learn the syntax of a DSL, we can use it to more easily solve problems in that specific domain. 
Some examples of DSLs are SQL, CSS, regular expressions, and make that we use to write make files. Here is a part of an XML parser implementation that uses Boost Spirit. Boost Spirit is a library for writing runtime parsers, and it has a DSL. In this example, text is defined as all characters that aren't opening angle brackets. Then we defined node, start tag, and end tag. Finally, XML is defined as a starting tag, followed by a list of node, followed by a matching end tag. As you can see, we can make C++ look like a completely different language. But there are still some limitations. The syntax must be valid C++ because it needs to be parsed and compiled by the C++ compiler. Let's assume we wanted a different syntax. For, the syntax for parsing a list of node is star node. But let's assume we wanted a different syntax. What if we wanted to write node star instead? Well, in this case, we will get a compilation error because the unary star operator must be on the left side of the expression. Let's do a quick recap with a filter transform example. Here we have a vector of cats, and we want to get the names and IDs of all the cats over the age of 42. So we iterate over the vector, check if the age is bigger than 42, and if so, we push a tuple with the ID and name. We can use modern C++ syntax and replace the range based and replace the iterators with a range-based for loop to make our code more expressive. But this is 2023, and we have ranges now. We can use the overloaded pipe operator to chain multiple operations. And now our code literally says filter transform. But what if we wanted to write it with an SQL-like syntax? So we can do it with a parser. First, we create a parser. Then we use the parser to parse the SQL syntax into a function. Finally, we call the function. And we are done, right? Well, not exactly, because there are some differences. First, we have the overhead of creating the parser and parsing the string into a function. Also, the return type of the function must be type erased, for example, by using studenty. This is because it depends on the output of the parser, which happens at runtime. So at compile time, we don't know what type we get. We can solve all three problems by shifting the parsing to compile time. Now we no longer have the runtime overhead of creating the parser and parsing the string to a function. And we also know at compile time the exact return type of the function. Finally, we can wrap the parsing logic of creating the parser and parsing the string to a function inside as a literal operator. Now our code is a single line of SQL-like syntax. Let's generalize it. In the examples that we just saw, we use the parser to convert SQL syntax into a lambda. But the general case of compile time parsers is that we can use a string literal to create an island of our own costume syntax inside C++ and parse it into any compile time value. Is something like this even possible? Spoiler alert, the answer is yes, and by the end of the talk, you will know how. But we need to start from the beginning, which in my case was a Google search. So I asked Google, hey, did anyone try to do this crazy thing in C++? And the answer was yes, of course, there is already a boost library for it. <laughs> Which leads us to the first library of this talk. Boost Metaparse is a compile time library by Abel Sinkovich. Everything in the library uses C++ 98, except for the creation of the compile time string. In C++ 98, we have to write each character as a separate template parameter. Which kind of bits our goal of achieving expressive code? Luckily, in C++ 11, we can use the Boost Metaparse string macro with a string literal. For compile time computations, Boost Metaparse uses me uh, template structs, which are also known as meta functions. A typical parser in Boost Metaparse is a struct that has an inner apply meta function, which takes the input string and the current parsing position and returns the parsing result with some additional information. Let's talk about the syntax of meta functions. The syntax and techniques needed are pretty horrendous. And this is not me saying, it's from the C++ core guidelines about template metaprogramming. Here you can see an example code that creates a calculator parser and uses boost metaparse with template metaprogramming. And judge the syntax for yourself. While you might say the pretty horrendous is a bit harsh, having to express everything in terms of template structs instead of if branches, for loops, and other basic syntax elements 
is definitely not something that we would like to do. Let's go over some features of Boost MetaParse. We can use Boost MetaParse to create a runtime function or a compile time meta function from a costume syntax. The difference between them is whether our parsing result is a struct that has an apply meta function or a struct that overloads the call operator. We can also use Boost MetaParse to create meta functions from Haskell-like syntax, which you might prefer over the template metaprogramming syntax. In this example, the meta edge ace type is a compile time map, and it is used here as a symbol table. The import call adds a meta function to the map. The define call creates a new meta function from the Haskell syntax and adds it to the map. Each call returns the new modified map, so we can nicely change them together. In the end, we can get the new meta functions from the map and use them in C++. We can also use boost meta parse to create a grammar from grammar rules. For each rule, we define the syntax and an optional semantic action to take. Let's see how the boost meta parse string macro works. What I want you to take from this is not the inner working of the macro, but more to understand how difficult it was to create a compile time string in C11. So the macro expands to something like this a call to make string with the length of the string, followed by many calls to str8 with the string and the running index. str8 is a context per function that takes a string and an index and returns the character at that index, or zero if the index is past the length of the string. In C11, context per functions were limited to a single return statement. So this is, this is pretty much the limit of what was possible. After evaluation, the parameters are the length of the string, followed by the characters of the string, and then a lot of trailing zeros. Make string is a meta function that recursively concatenates the string until it reaches the original length. And so we are left with the compile time string that we wanted. Look how much tricks and effort were necessary in C11 to do something that we can easily write today in a few lines. And with that, let's move to C17. Lexi is a compile time uh, parsing library by Jonathan Mueller. Everything in this library, um, the library has an expressive DSL for uh, writing parser combinators. It supports Unicode string and can parse at runtime and compile time. We can create a parser by defining a struct that has a rule and a value. The rules specify how to match the input string and can be implemented as a parser combinator. And the value specifies how to store the parsing result. In C17, Consexper became a lot more powerful compared to C11. Here, we create the rule by using an immediately invoked Consexper lambda. And inside the lambda, we can write compile time code in a similar way that we write runtime code and we can do a lot more than just a single return statement. Lexi has an online playground that you can use to, that has many examples. You can write the parser and the input string and see how it produces the parsing result. It is a great tool for learning about parser combinators in general or Lexi specifically. As I mentioned before, Lexi can parse at compile time or runtime. Here we have a JSON parsing benchmark. And as you can see, Lexi have similar performance to other, compile time, other JSON parsing libraries. So you get a library that can parse at compile time or runtime without sacrificing performance. Okay, this is how a typical parser in Lexi looks like. So we have an outer struct with an inner context per parse function, similar to the apply meta function in boost meta parse. But now between them, we have another struct called indirect that takes a next parser template parameter. The parse function can invoke the next parser with additional or modified arguments. This design decision solves the problem of dealing with different return type. The results are simply passed to the next parser as arguments. You can think of it as a callback or continuation. In Lexi, the sequence parser combinator is a parser combinator that takes two parsers, P1 and P2, and creates a new parser where P1 must be followed by P2. And in Lexi, it is implemented by simply redirecting the next uh, parser template parameter. So the code that you see here, during parsing, P1 will invoke P2, which will then invoke the next parser. We have just seen two libraries for creating compile-time parsers. Now it's time for something different. 
Compile time regular expressions, or CTRE, was created by Hannah Dusikova. With this library, we can, we can perform regex operations like matching, searching, and capturing at runtime or compile time. The library also supports Unicode strings. We can create a regular expression from a string literal by using the CTRE literal operator or by passing it as a non-type template parameter. One limitation of the library is that the regex pattern must be known at compile time, but it is already a common practice to have the regex as part of the source code. For example, if we want to match a date format. In terms of performance, the construction of the regex happens at compile time, so there is zero runtime overhead. And performing a regex operation like matching can be done at runtime or, or compile time. And from this benchmark, we can see that CTRE is much faster than std regex and have similar performance to boost regex. Let's see how the CTRE literal operator works. First, we have the fixed string class, which has a context per constructor that takes an array of characters. When we call the CTRE literal operator, it will use the string literal to create a, a fixed string and pass it as a non-type template parameter. Inside the body of the uh, overloaded operator, the string is passed into a regex. The passing of the string uh, into a, to a regex uh, uses an LL1 parser. Here is a quick overview of how the LL1 parsing algorithm works. It takes the input string. Eternally, it has a stack that it pushes and pops values from. And it has a parsing table that represents the rules of the grammar and is used to determine the next action the parsing algorithm should take. The stack of the LL1 parser is implemented as empty struct. And performing uh, operations on the stack, like pushing and popping values, is done with overloaded functions. The LL1 parsing table of the regex grammar is also implemented as empty structs and function overloads. I think this is a very elegant design that shows how such a complex system can be implemented with these two basic building blocks. The parsing loop takes the input string, the, the stack, and the current parsing position. First, it calls the overloaded rule function of the grammar, which essentially performs a lookup into the parsing table. Then it decides what it needs to do next, depending on the action. We can return an error or success, or recourse to the next iteration with modified parameters. After we have seen how LL1 parsing works, it's time to move to a different library, but this one uses the LR1 algorithm. Compile Time Parser Generator, or CTPG, was created by Peter Winter and uses C17. As the name suggests, the library can generate LR1 parser from a grammar at compile time. You can use the library with your own costume lexer or let it generate one for you. In order to create, uh, to define the grammar and generate the parser, we first need to define all the terminals and non-terminals that will be used in the grammar. With CTPG, we can uh, define operator precedence so that multiplication will be evaluated before subtraction and also associativity. So if we have a chain of subtraction, they will be evaluated from left to right. We can also define a terminal by using a regex pattern. Then we can combine all the terminals and non-terminals to create the grammar rules by using an expressive DSL, which are then used to, create the, to generate the parser. Because all the non-terminals have already been defined, we can use them to create recursive rules. Here is a quick overview of how LL1 parser generator works. It takes, the, it takes a grammar and then uses it to compute item sets, which represents all the states that can be reached during parsing. It then computes uh, from the item sets the parsing tables, which will be used to transition between stats, sets during parsing. An item of the LR1 item sets uh, contain a contain the index of the rule that it refers to, the current, the current position in the rule, and the terminal of the, and the, that of the next look ahead that can follow it. CTPG first computes the, um, the, the number of rules, the maximum number of positions, and the number of terminals. It then, uses, it then multiplies them all to compute the address space of all possible LR1 items. And so a bit set is, is implemented, just, a set is implemented at just a fixed size bit set. 
which solves the problem because we, right now we don't have a context per set in C++. Then it defines two functions to convert between an item and an index so that adding, removing, and finding items in the set are implemented by bit set operations. It shows how such a complex system can... Um, no. It shows that some problems of compile time code can become a lot simpler if we find an upper limit and use a fixed size container. Let's move to C++23. Macro rules was created by Maxim Pasichnik, and we can use it to create a DSL with Rust's macro rule syntax. Before we take a look at the library, here is a quick overview of Rust's macros. Rust have two types of macros, declarative macros and procedural macros. A procedural macro or a proc macro is a function that takes the a token stream and returns the new token stream of the new generated code. We can call a proc macro directly or pass it to another macro, for example, the derived macro, which will call each one of the macros in parentheses with the tokens of the struct below it. This library isn't about proc macros, but at this point, you can already have an idea about how they can be implemented in C++. Declarative macros are declared by using the macro rules uh, syntax, which has two parts. The first one specifies how to match a syntax pattern, and the second one produces an AST. In this case, the VEC macro will match a list of an expressions separated by comma. And it will in this case, it will create a temporary vector and generate a push call for each of the expressions. Let's see how we can do something similar in C++ by using the macro rules library. First, we declare a struct called sum that inherits from macro rules matching syntax. In this case, it is the word sum followed by a list of numbers. In, inside the struct, we have a const eval transform function that takes a context and will be used to produce the output. We can get the list of arguments from the context and pass them to std apply, and then use a fold expression to calculate the sum. We can invoke the new sum macro rule by calling apply rules with the name of the struct and the text that you want to match. Internally, the library uses a compile time parser to create a template that represents the AST. You can also write the template directly, but I think the macro rule syntax is more expressive and easier to work with. Identifier strings in macro rules are only used for a quality comparison and for lookup. So they are converted to a 32-bit hash values because it is easier and more efficient to pass around 32-bit value than a variable size string. If we take a look at the implementation of apply rules, we can see that it is a preprocessor macro that takes a text and converts it into a string literal and passes it into a function that does the, match the matching and transformation. A few things to keep in mind when using a macro to convert text into a string literal. One is that, is that comments won't be part of the string, so you get support for comments for free. The second thing is that syntax highlighting will still work inside the macro, at least in all the editors that I tested. And finally, if you have multiple white spaces, they will be collapsed into a single space. So keep that in mind in, if you are thinking of a syntax that relies on white spaces, like in Python. And finally, we have yet another compile time parser, which is a very basic parser combinator that I wrote. And we will use it to implement some examples and show what can be done with compile time parsers. It has a DSL similar to Lexi and Boot Spirit. Uh, so the binary OR operator creates a choice parser. The bit shift write operator will create a sequence parser. The star operator will create a list parser or repeat parser. And the bit shift write equal will pass the parsing result if the, if the parser succeeds into a lambda. The return types of all the parser combinators use fixed size containers, like a variant, a tuple, or a vector with a fixed capacity. We can use C23's std expected to represent the parse result, which can be a value or a parsing error. A parser is just a stateless lambda uh, being wrapped inside of a template class which takes the, um, the parsing context and returns the parsing result, where the parsing context uh, 
contains the input string and the current parsing position. We can define a concept that checks if a type is an instantiation of the parser template. It is implemented by calling the parser constructor with the concept argument and checking if they have the same type. We would like to uh, have different overload for our, uh, for our parser combinator operator for the sequence parser. There can be two cases. One that the user wants to create a new sequence from existing parser, and another if the user wants to add a, a parser to an existing sequence. And we can do it by using concept. We define the sequence parser concept as a parser that uses the sequence parsing function. So it is more specific than the regular parser concept. And therefore, when we will call the overloaded operator, it will reach the correct function. And we won't get an ambiguity error. Now I have a question for you. What kind of string is used in every C++ application and was always been known at compile time? Empty. What? Empty no. 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 No, the source code, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it is the source code because this is also the input to the compiler, so it must be known at compile time. Which leads us to, the, uh, to reflection. So C++ has many introspection features. For example, we can use a concept to check if a type has a specific uh, data member or a function. But having reflection as, type of, as part of the language is still far away. So for example, we can ask a type to give us all its data members, base classes, and attributes. But there are some reflection libraries that you can use right now. Most reflection libraries use a macro to generate the reflection metadata. In this case, in the rare CPP library, we can use the reflect macro inside the class to reflect all the data members, or outside of it to reflect just the public ones. We can use a macro to pass the same text twice. One to generate a code, and another to generate a string literal that will be passed into a compile time parser. In this case, the macro will generate a function that uses a compile time parser to reflect the attributes of the struct. While it is not a viable approach to try and parse the entire C++ syntax at compile time, it is possible to, to parse just part of it. For example, the attributes. We can define two macros uh, that takes a source code and reflect some attributes of this source code. One will reflect the attributes of the struct, and another will reflect the data members. Then we can define the macro, which we will call derive, that takes a list of macros and will invoke each one of them with the string literal of the source code. This is one way to implement Rust's derive macro and create a similar system to procedural macros in C++. <laughs> but I think the more interesting use case for reflection is to use it to enhance our compile time parsers. First, we will look at a different kind of reflection um, that gets a value by an identifier. So here we have a resolve identifier function. And for the rest of the slides, I reduced the word identifiers to ident uh, to fit it in the space that I have. So the resolve identifier, um, so in this case, when we will call the resolve identifier with a 32-bit hash value of the string x, we will get a pointer to the x data member. We can use a repeating macro to generate a resolve identifier function for each one of the data members of the object. Then we can create a function to get a data member by identifier. It will first call the uh, static resolve identifier function of the type to get a pointer to data member, and then use the pointer to data member to get the actual data member from the object. Let's see how we can integrate reflection with, compil with compile time parsers. And in this case, we'll implement a syntax that returns a nested data member. And the syntax will be a list of uh, identifiers separated by dots. The output of the parser is a fixed size uh, vector uh, that includes the, the uh, hash values of the identifiers. We need a function to get the nested data member from an object. And this is an approach that I sometimes use when, write compi when writing compile time code. 
First, I write the logic as runtime like pseudocode. Here we create a local variable called result that points to the input object. Then we iterate over the list of members and call get member to get the next nested data member and store it in the result variable. Finally, we return the result. Now there are some steps that we need to take to make it into a working, functioning C++ code. The first step is to remove the compile time argument into a template, template parameter. In this case, we move the members uh, argument to be a non-type template parameter. The next step that we need to take is to replace loops with either a recursion or a fold expression. In this case, we replace the loop that iterates over the members with a recursive lambda, and we can write recursive lambda in C++23 by using deducing this. So here, the self parameter um, reference the current lambda, so we can recursively call it. The final step that we need to take is to replace branches with if consexpr. In this case, we use if consexpr to check if we need to exit the recursive lambda. Finally, we can wrap it in a string literal, which returns a lambda, and inside the lambda, it will first call the parser to get the list of members, and then call the get nested uh, function to get the nested member of our input uh, variable. And we got our desired syntax. Okay, now, let's examine the, um, the output uh, assembly. Right, so um, here we have uh, the code that the compiler generated, and as you can see, it's generated a lot of code. But you won't find here any reference to the input string or the compile time parsing. It is all gone. The code here only refers to the get uh, member function and to the recursive lambda. The reason it generated so much code is because, um, because we are compiling it with O0. So, so the compiler essentially emits the code as is without any optimization. Let's change it to 01. And now the, we have, for the both functions, the ones that use our costume syntax and the ones that use the regular syntax, the compiler produced the exact same instructions. So we have zero runtime overhead abstraction. Um. Let's extend the syntax by adding two new operators. The first one, column, will perform a range-based for loop, and the pipe operator will call a function with the current value. First, we need to create a parser that supports the extended syntax. The pipe operator parser will match a pipe operator followed by an identifier and will return a struct called type pipe that wraps the identifier. The iterate parser will return an empty struct. The extended parser is a list of variants where each variant can be a pipe or an iterate or a list of members. Once again, inside the implementation function, we use a recursive lambda to iterate over the variants inside of the list. And at each iteration, we check the current value inside the variant. If we have a list of members, then we call the, the get nested function and pass the result to the next iteration of the recursive uh, Lambda. If we need to iterate, we perform a range-based for loop and pass each element to the recursive lambda. Finally, if we need to perform a, the pipe operator, we can get the identifier out of the pipe. And now what? We need some way to call a function based on an identifier. It can be done by using the same technique that we used to get a data member, but this time with a free function instead of a static member function. So this resolve identifier function will map to the square, uh, will map the identifier square into the square function. And if we want, we can wrap it in a macro to reduce boilerplate. So now when we, we can call resolve identifier to get the function um, that the pipe operation should perform, uh, and we are done, right? Well, actually no, because the loop up for the, because the loop up for the resolve identifier function will be based on the scope of the implementation function, not on where we use the syntax. 
For example, if the resolve identifier function is defined inside an namespace, it will not be found. We can solve this problem by moving the call to resolve identifier outside of the implementation function and where we use the, the actual syntax. And then pass it back into implementation function as a lambda. So now when the implementation function will call the scope lambda, it will call the, uh, the lambda, which will then call the resolve identifier function so that the lookup will be based on the current scope. And now it will find the square function. Finally, we can wrap the, the syntax that creates um, the lambda that calls the resolve identifier function with a macro, which we will call scope. Because our scope is just a lambda that maps an identifier to a value, we can also use it to reflect local members, uh, local variables. Now let's compare the, um, the generated assembly. So um, here we have two functions, one that uses the regular C++ syntax and another that uses the new syntax. And let me put them side by side. Our, the compiler produced the exact same instructions for both of them with just the O of one level of optimization. So we have zero runtime overhead again. <coughs> Um, okay, so let's compare the syntax. Our new costume syntax um, it can be written from left to right. Um, the boilerplate of, of writing a range-based for loop is reduced to a single column character, and we can chain multiple function calls by using the pipe operator. Overall, we have created a more expressive syntax for this very specific kind of problems. Um, now I have a question for you. Can anybody tell me why this code doesn't compile? No operator space. No. It's five variable? Yes, you are correct. The reason this code doesn't compile is because the X is a private variable inside the C class. So if we will try to compile it, we'll, we'll get a, an error that says that C is not a valid non-type template parameter because it is not structural. And the reason it is not structural is, as you said, because it has a private variable. In C++20, the definition of a structural type has changed to include context per uh, class types, but they must have the following properties. All the all, uh, data members must be private and non-mutable, and also all data members must be structural, so the entire composition tree must be public. std tuple and std variant are not structural because they have a private data member. So I had to write my own basic version of them that has all public data members. It took less effort and code that I expected thanks to deducing this. Okay, we have seen how we can use a parser to create a, a function. Now let's see how we can use them to create types. So we will create a struct um, which will use the um, TypeScript-like syntax. So our parser will match an opening curly brackets followed by a list of members where each member is two identifiers separated by a colon and finally a closing curly bracket. Our output will be a list of members where each member will be parsed into a tuple of two identifiers, one for the name and another for the type. We will need a way to convert from an identifier to a type and we can do it by using the helper type wrapper uh, class, which will enable us to return a type as a, as a value. And so the resolve identifier will map the int identifier into um, an int type wrapper. We will use this struct member type to implement a single data member of our final struct. It takes an identifier of the name and the, and the type wrapper of the type and internally, it will contain a data member of the type that we want, and also a, an access function to get the data member by using an identifier. 
We can then combine multiple struct members into a single struct by inheriting from all of them. This is how the function that creates the struct looks like. It takes the, in it takes the input string and the scope that we will use to map identifiers. We first pass the string into a, to get the data members and then create an index sequence for each one of the members and expand it into a parameter pack. We use the fall expression to create a struct member for each of, for each of the parsed tuples that represents the data members. The first identifier is, is the name of the struct and is passed as is. The second identifier um, represents the type and we can use the scope lambda to convert it into a type wrapper. Then we can finally return a type wrapper um, with our struct type from the function. And this is an example of how our new syntax looks like. Inside the struct macro, the, the text is converted into a string literal and passed to the create struct function. So far, we have seen linear syntax and, parser, and parsers, but it is very common to parse trees. For our final example, we will see how we can use compile time parsers to create tree data structures. And our target syntax will be JSON. First, we define aliases for array, object, and string. Then, we define var as a variant of all the possible JSON data types. Notice here that inside the variant, object, array, and string are all pointers. When we create a tree data structure and runtime, we usually use pointers from a parent to its node children. Nodes are, are uh, often dynamically allocated and should preferably be stored as smart pointers. Here we have an example of code that creates a JSON at runtime. If we will try to make the JSON variable code sexpert, we will get a compilation error. It is possible to use new inside the consexpert function, but all allocated variables must be deallocated and can't be stored inside the consexpert variable. We can solve this problem by using a compile time allocator. Here we have a basic compile time allocator that contains a tuple of fixed capacity vectors, one for each type. The add method stores a value in one of the fixed vex that the tuple holds. Now we can replace the calls to new with calls to allocator add and store the result in a context per variable. We pass the allocator along with the input string to the JSON parser and store the result as the root of the JSON tree. Notice here that the, struct, uh, that the JSON struct holds the, the root of the variable along with the compile time allocator. And this is how we can create a, a JSON from a string literal at compile time. Now, because the, um, the JSON variable holds not just the JSON, but also the compile time allocator, which is very big, you may say, how will it affect the output binary size? Well, if you are only using the context per variable at, at compile time, it will not be included in the final binary. If it is used at runtime, then it must be included in binary. And in this case, there are some things that you can do to reduce its size. One option that you have is to first run a lightweight parser to compute the necessary capacity, and then only uh, use, use this capacity inside the compile time allocator. Another option is to copy um, the, the values from an object with a large capacity to a smaller object that allocates only the needed size. Okay, when should you use compile time parsers? The first thing to ask is do you need a domain specific language or a general purpose language? If you need a domain, domain specific language, then compile time parsers are really good for it. But for general purpose language, I recommend using the regular C++ syntax. The next thing to ask is can your desired syntax be expressed with operators? If it can, then you should probably use operator overloading instead. The last thing to consider is how your, your DSL will, within, will interact with C++. Self-contained syntaxes like regex or einsam are perfect candidates for compile time parsing because they, they don't refer to any external variables. You can allow your users to, uh, to provide explicit access to external variable by using import table, similar to how boost metaparse enables adding meta function to its Haskell parsing environment. Or if you want a scope-based lookup, you can use reflection with the resolve identifier mechanism. 
you might already be using reflection library if you're in your code if you are binding to a um, to a scripting language or if you're using it for serialization. So which compile time library should you choose? If you are using a version before C17, your only option is to use boost metaparse. For C17 and, and, and newer languages, uh, versions, you can use uh, Lexi if you prefer to write your parsers as parser combinators, or CTRE if you, prefer, if you want to use regular expressions. If you prefer to generate your parser from an LR1 grammar, then use CTPG. For more experimental things with C23, if you want to see how macro rules can be implemented in C, check the macro rules library. Or if you would like to see how reflection can be integrated with parsers and see the full implementation of the examples in, in the previous slides, check out YACP. Okay, let's talk about, about errors. Here we have two kinds of errors. The one is because I forgot to add a semicolon, and this is the kind of error that I would like to, to get. The second one is because I used invalid syntax to create a regex by using CTRE, and it is definitely less friendly. From the error message, we can see that it failed at a static assert that validates the syntax. And we can see that there is a problem at position four. While it provides enough information to understand what is the problem, Ideally, we would like to get error messages like the one above. And I'm not just picking on CTRE. From what I tested, CTRE consistently provided better compile time error messages compared to other libraries. There are ways to print arbitrary strings in C20 to produce better error messages and warnings. Vittorio used it to implement a compile time Wordle game, and I used it to create a compile time code generation library. Um, for more details, check out the links here or come to my open content session on Thursday. So how bad are the compile times? I'm guessing all of you have been asking that all along. Um, so we will, see, we will soon see some benchmark results, but keep in mind that they can drastically change depending on many things, such as the complexity of the syntax that you are trying to parse, the parsing algorithms that you are using and how well optimized it is, it can change between compilers and between compiler versions, and it will also depend on the hardware and other variables. So to get accurate results, you should run a, a benchmark or a profile for your use case. But I still ran some benchmark, which can hopefully give you a rough idea of what kind of numbers you should expect. I used MSVC to compile and debug and release the examples we saw in the previous slides, which use my very unoptimized parser combinator. The numbers that you see here are in seconds and show the results of five runs, as the, the average of five runs. I didn't include the variance because it was very small. The top row show how long it takes to compile the entire project. Uh, and the bottom row show how long it takes comp to compile the project, but after I removed all the, co the code that calls the compile time parsers. So around 1.5 seconds difference. Then I generated another benchmark that compiled 1,000 structs by either using the regular C++ syntax or the TypeScript-like syntax that we saw in the example. I would like to clarify that you shouldn't use compile time parsers to re-implement structs, as they are better used for things that can't be easily expressed with regular C++ syntax. So parsing 1,000 structs adds an around 100 to 200 milliseconds over the baseline. And it's good to know that compilers are very efficient at this task. Using the costume syntax adds additional 14 seconds, which average to around 14 milliseconds per struct. One tip when writing compile time code is to try to make it as similar to runtime code. It is easier to understand because they use the same syntax, unlike in template metaprogramming. If you want to debug it, you can just remove the context per keyword and put some breakpoints. And also, you can share the same code between compile time and runtime and not write a different version for each. It can also lead to faster compile times and uh, less memory consumption. For example, I wrote a different parser that parses a JSON into a template tree, and it took over one mi minute and four gigabytes of RAM instead of 1.5 seconds. I have experienced the same behavior with other compilers when using large template trees, and I recommend avoiding it when possible. Compile-time parsing are not something new. 
They have been available in C++ since C++11, or arguably C++98. Their viability depends on how easy it is or difficult to write compile time code and use it. And it also depends on compilation speed. Both have significantly improved over the years through new language features, discovery of new techniques, compile time imp compiler improvements, and faster hardware. And we can assume that they will continue to improve in the future. For example, in C23, we get if once the val, which checks if a function is executed at runtime or compile time. It can be used to better optimize implementation of a function to the execution environment. As far as I know, this proposal should be part of C26, and it adds supports for user generated error messages in a static assert. So we can generate better error messages for compile time parsing errors. Eventually, we will reach the point where we will have a DSL for every domain, and they will all interact seamlessly through C++. But maybe I'm completely wrong, and we will all be replaced by AI. Who knows? <laughs> My personal hope is that in a few years, there will be another talk about compile time parsers, and it will show code that uses C++ 17, or 20, or 23, and say, look how difficult it was to do something that we can easily write today in a few lines. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this talk. <laughs> and if you have any questions, you can ask them now or later. Yes. So you, uh, you mentioned uh, better error messages, and you mentioned static assert, uh, like custom error messages. But the biggest kind of pain of error messages is actually the one you've shown, where you don't really get to static assert. The error message you get is substitution fail, which means like there is nothing to assert. It couldn't figure out which template you want to instantiate. If, do you have any hints for dealing with those? So the, uh, the question was about dealing with uh, compilation errors that are due to, um, to picking to uh, substitution function failure yeah, like uh, of the template parameters. It was actually our message saying substitution fail. Yeah. Um, you can't um, reduce, so when you, uh, when you have like this kind of error, um, well, ideally you will design your code in a way that you wouldn't use this kind of error to provide the user with your error messages. Um, you would put a static assert or another mechanism like, uh, like for, for a contextual function. Um, the, in any case, the compiler will still um, may generate like uh, well, in the examples that I showed, the, the problem was not a substitution. F it says it says like a static assert failure. I think it was substitution failure that it said that type argument four is incomplete type, and then it went on to like basically it didn't even instantiate. Um, Please use the microphone. There's a microphone in the middle of the room. That, this way, we'll get it on the uh, video recording. No, the, the error is invalid use or incomplete type. Um, and it says static assert um, that, that checks in, that, that failed in the check if the, the result is correct. But uh, to, to your point, um, you can't, uh, like below this message, there was hundreds of other lines of the kind of template uh, metaprogramming error messages that you, we usually get. And these ones, the compiler will print anyway. I don't know of a way to avoid it. But in the end of them, you can provide your own static assert message, which will hopefully give um, as much information in a, the most uh, declarative way to the user to understand what the problem is. Um, Any other question? <coughs> OK, so uh, yes. So it seems like uh, you would need to understand a lot of advanced features in order to uh, use this in practice. So can you recommend any uh, resources for practicing 
uh, like const expo and all the related newer features from C++ so that you can do this without uh, wasting a lot of time. Yeah, um, so um, regarding parsers, I will recommend for concepts of parsing, I will recommend looking at Lexi and trying out the, the playground. Um, you can take the exact same code and then uh, put it in a consexpr function, and then you will have a consexpr parser. Um, for more general, uh, like compile time computations and consexpr techniques, um, I don't know if any one single resource that um, shows them all, um, but I left a lot of uh, links along the slides. So um, that goes into more details about the implementation of each of the, um, the parts of code and techniques that were used. And I recommend checking them because they are really amazing. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, just about the errors. So we found a lot of success with a monadic approach. So when you have a function that has what I was finite requirements, uh, you return some special error type when finite requirements fail. So instead of letting the compiler do it, you do if constex per my concepts that failed, return error type. And only at the very top level, you have a special overload, like if my function returned an error type, go into this error failed. And there I do static assert for my compile time requirements. I don't know how much sense that made, but basically you remove all of the stack trace that gets in the people's way and the error becomes much closer to people's code. Yeah, uh, great. I wasn't aware of these techniques and uh, it's, yeah, it's a good way to solve the, the problem of having a huge uh, template instantiation stuck in your error. So thank you for sharing it. Yes. Yeah, definitely check the C++ uh, weekly playlist. I've seen many episodes and it's amazing. Uh, so check it out. Okay, so um, I think we are done. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>